All right, sorry we're not doing uh, Caleb and the Giant Librarians um, because I got so many good feedbacks or inputs that uh, I didn't have time to process all of them. And uh, considering that today is Palm Sunday, um, I thought it would be appropriate to do something that relates to Easter. So uh, this is the day when people came out and they waved the palm branches and say, Hosanna, the son of David, and all that other good stuff. And they're the same people who, you know, at the end of the week are yelling, crucify him. Yeah, so um, we're talking about the fickleness of hoax in a few minutes. So uh, my Bible program sends me, um, you know, a little excerpt. And then I usually always listen to the chapter. I realized I hadn't really done something on the whole chapter. Um, I, I kind of like the ideas when you go through the Gospels to look at um, what, happened just before Jesus went into the upper room with the disciples. And so like, what's his last parts of public ministry? So in the past, I've done things on his farewell tour. He went back and visited a number of spots and what were the lessons from there. And uh, as I was looking at reading this thing to John 12, I thought, there's a lot of good stuff in here. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to appreciate it as well. There's a theme that ties it together, which hopefully you'll see. Um, if not, we're all in trouble, but um, we're going to basically just go through it and see why the Holy Spirit included this information um, just before Jesus went to the upper room and washed the disciples' feet and had the supper and then went to the cross. So, you know, John 13 through 15, up to 17, where he does his prayer, are like we spent a lot of time in that. John 15 is really important about how to live the Christian life and abide. But uh, I, there's some good stuff in here as well. It's actually good stuff anywhere you look in the Bible, but, you know, so let's get back to the beginning. Okay. So these points aren't going to flow as nice as some others, and you know, um, but they kind of summarize what they, uh, is underneath them. So the death, burial, and resurrection bring about belief. We're going to see that in the life of Lazarus. Um, we, we'll see also that belief engenders opposition, and you're going to see it from within as well as from without. Um, but it, the belief brings about glory uh, to the Lord of life and to those who follow him. So that's kind of a little, it doesn't roll off the tongue nicely, but the idea is that um, there's stuff in the death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to look a little bit more at it next week when we uh, look at uh, Easter itself. That is designed to bring glory to God. And the thing that kind of, the link between those two is this concept of belief. And belief is always going to be met by opposition. So John 12, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, which is on that side. And that's where Lazarus uh, lived, with Mary and Martha. And there were, from other gospel accounts, we know that House of uh, Lazarus, I mean, Simon the leper. So he was having a uh, party. Uh, maybe he was turning 40. So anyway, um, Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, was there as well. Uh, and Lazarus sat at the table. Um, but Mary, I mean, Martha was doing her serving thing. So, you know, it's like <laughs> Martha would be a great guest to have over to your house. You know, shows up. what can I do to help? She doesn't even ask. She just jump into the kitchen and start doing things. Um, Mary, on the other hand, now, remember, what do you know about Mary from the past? She normally was the one who sat at Jesus' feet. And she actually takes a pound of some very uh, costly perfume and anoints the feet of Jesus. Um Wiping the feet with his hair? I don't know, maybe she just forgot a towel. But um, <laughs> the other accounts talk about her in your head. But here, it's interesting that John does the feet thing, and then Jesus is going to wash the disciples' feet in the next one. So John's got something going on there. John's got lots of stuff going on that I don't understand, but there's uh, some good stuff there. But the thing I do want to have noticed is two things. One, they throw in this little phrase, the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And it's not like it was still with the you know, wonderful aromas of the food or any of that other stuff. But her sacrificial service resulted in this really nice thing. And in Matthew, Jesus says, there's something you're supposed to add to the gospel. I'm sure you all heard people say, oh, we don't want to add anything to the gospel. We want nothing about Jesus and him crucified. Because they happen to read Paul in Corinthians. However, they didn't read Matthew, which says, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, add this to it. Tell what this woman 
has done as a memorial to her. So Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He died for your sins. And there was this woman who, nobody shares the gospel like that. But, <laughs> but it, it's kind of significant that uh, Jesus was so um, appreciative of the symbol of devotion. Uh, she's at the feet of Jesus where she had always been. And, and it kind of puts up, you know, if you go back to Mary and Martha, Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better part, and our relationship with God is more important than our service for him, but we do have to have service for him. If you don't have the relationship with God and you try to serve him, you usually mess things up. Uh, you hurt yourself as well as those around you, so um, you have to make sure that um, you're spending the time at Jesus' feet, and uh, no sacrifice is too great. That, that Judas is going to basically complain that she's doing this. Um, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, who would betray him, said, uh, why was this fragrant oil not sold? I think it's 300 denarius. Denarius was a day's wage. So that's like what you earned for a year went into this perfume. And it should have been sold and given to the poor. But John goes on to tell us, he really didn't care for the poor because he was a thief. So he's kind of using this outward religious thing to gratify his own desires, which is what so many people with unsanctified hearts do. He was a thief, he had the money box, and he used to take uh, help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, let her alone. So he rebukes Judas. So you just see how Jesus, Judas does not have a good relationship with God because he doesn't want to see Jesus um, honored, nor the woman's service. And he's got the whole, you know, he's got the wrong values. And the wrong values eventually go back to him wanting stuff for himself, not for the uh, poor. Then Jesus is going to say, the poor you're always going to have with you, but me you do not always have. Now, um, I heard this when I was in college at an incredibly secular lecture. Um, I was at the hotel school, and I think they had a guest speaker come in, and um, he pulls out his wallet, and he pulls out a dollar and says, this is what you're here for, the almighty buck. <laughs> and he, uh, there was some interchange, I didn't pay attention to it, I was probably doing my homework for the next class, and um, one of the students mentioned something about uh, or he mentioned something, and then this lecturer responded, the poor you'll always have with you. So, obviously, about the Bible. And he said, you're not going to basically resolve poverty, you're not going to end poverty. And then some other student, basically from the back, shouted out something like, uh, but Jesus also said you could do with him whatever you want, and it, you know, actually getting this religious debate. In it. Um, but the reason I'm camping on this a little bit is I was reading a book this week, or going through a book in pulling excerpts out of it, called uh, Idols for Destruction. A guy called Schlush, Schlushenberg or something like that. It's just one of those long names. And he um, is, is listing a bunch of the idols from a really philosophical perspective. He talked about the idol of humanity, and then a subset of that is the poor. And um, what our church has done, not our church, you know, the church, is basically taken... It's very pharisaical. One little element of, it's all about ministering to the poor. And they are basically saying, we need to give money to the poor as opposed to examining why the poor are there and why some people have money to give. And really, it's the teaching of truth and embracing the right values that often gives rise to wealth. And it's the rejection of the truth and the wrong values which often gives rise to poverty. So if you give people money, and you know there's a huge amount of government budgets that is put towards that, and don't teach them how to live properly, you're going to keep them dependent upon you, which some would say is the purpose of modern government. <laughs> um, but that's another story. So anyway, there's a priority of Jesus over the poor. Jesus did come for the poor. He, you know, it's part of the gospel. The born oppressed would hear. Um, but that's not the priority of the church. The priority of the church is 
teaching people to obey the truth according to Jesus' last words. Um, now, a great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there, and they came, not for Jesus' only, Jesus' sake only, but because they also wanted to see Lazarus, whom he had raised for, from the dead. So, <clears throat> Jesus' work in Lazarus' life was drawing others to him. And uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about attracting people to the gospel. The, the work that God, that Jesus had done, was supposed to draw attention to God and his message, but people just wanted to see the celebrity. <laughs> so it's like, eh, can't always win. Now, the chief pre priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Now, if they thought a little bit, um, they would realize, wait, this guy was dead. He's now back to life. Now we're going to kill him. I wonder if he's going to come back. You know, it's like, <laughs> like, if we kill him, he might just get raised again. That might not be a good thing to do. But uh, they didn't want to have uh, evidence of what Jesus had done. And pe people plot to suppress God's glory. So now, if you notice, you have opposition from two different groups. You have the people within the church, Judas, and the people outside the church, the chief priest. Um, the reason that they're doing it is because they're losing followers. Because of the account of Jesus, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So uh, Lazarus uh, is one of the few believers who basically is a great witness to Jesus just by being alive. Think about it. What did Lazarus do? <laughs> All he did was die. Well, Jesus did say come forth, so I guess he had to hear him you know, come forth. But uh, just by, by virtue of being there and alive, he was being a testimony of Jesus that uh, Satan wanted to get rid of. So um, we're going to talk about the burial part. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Jesus waited after he heard that Lazarus was sick multiple days before he went and uh, resurrected him. Uh, two reasons. Uh, the minor reason is because the Sadducees believe that the spirit left the body after a couple of days. So they wanted to wait until that was all gone. Um, the other one is he wanted to make sure he healed on a Sabbath just to stick it in the Pharisees' face. So um, he did that, and it, it, the Pharisees didn't really appreciate this, as you can basically figure out. Okay, so the next thing we're going to see is we're going to see if there's a question. Sure. Um, we, one of the thoughts as to why he waited is that the Sadducees believed that the spirit did not de uh, depart from the body after a couple of days. So he wanted to make sure that, uh, to show them that this was not just a resuscitation. This was a totally dead guy without a spirit that he was resurrecting because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So there are multiple things God accomplishes in his purposes. Um, and he normally is, uh, opposed to just Pharisees, but the Sadducees were the other sect that you, I mean, all the way around, Sadducees were the other sect. Anyway, a team witness to the reality of the Messiah in our lives produces enduring change versus ephemeral enthusiasm. I never get to use ephemeral. It's like, that's a, it's a great word. It's just like, it's just like evaporates. And if I wanted to yeah, I couldn't find a good word that began with E. I'm sure you've been during, yeah, I don't know, um, endothermic reactions. Anyway, so the next day, um, there was a great multitude that had come to the feast. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! This just means something, we pray, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So uh, this obviously would um, be something the Pharisees would not be pleased with. The Herodians would not be pleased with it because Herod was supposed to be the king, and now here is this you know, Jesus guy um, who is the savior, and he is saving. So then, um, this is Palm Sunday. So the other accounts tell us they took their cloaks, and it tells about the donkeys and all that other stuff. But uh, John doesn't say that. Then Jesus, when he found a young donkey... Oh, no, here's a contradiction in the Bible. Jesus told the disciples to get the donkey, and here we see that Jesus found the donkey. Therefore, we shouldn't be believing any of this. Oh, what are we going to do? You know. <laughs> well, is there any other savior we can figure, you know, find? Is there anyone else that, you know, maybe there's a way to figure this out? You know, it's like, 
Obviously, Jesus tells them to go find it, and John is leaving out the stuff in between. Um, and he's doing this to fulfill a prophecy out of Zechariah. So instead of coming in on a you know, charging white horse with a chariot and a trumpet sounds, uh, he shows up on a foal and a donkey. So a donkey's called. So I'm trying to figure out. They got two, and I'm trying to figure out. Does like was the little one for his feet? I, I don't know how he did that. But you know, really, my salvation doesn't depend on how Jesus sat on the donkey. Okay, so they were both there, and I don't, I don't know. Um, in Zechariah, uh, it says, uh, "O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, right, righteous, um, and has salvation, and he's lowly, meek, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey." That looks like it's almost one, but I don't know. That's why you had to have the two, because some people wanted to see the donkey, others wanted to see the pole and donkey. I, I don't know. But Jesus is doing things in fulfillment of the Old Testament. He came in the fulfillment of the word lots of times. And uh, it's not normal for a king to be on a donkey, because that's like, you know, it was one of a three-speed bicycle, um, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, some... 10-speed mountain bike or 15-speed mountain bike. So he, he's coming not as the conquering king, but as the humble servant, the servant of Isaiah 53, to bring salvation to his people through the forgiveness of his sins, of their sins. So his disciples didn't understand these things at first. So I wonder if the disciples had any hair left because they're constantly scratching to trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, the, the things that they don't get astounds me. Um, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. Huh? What happened? So one of the themes that shows up here is the concept of glory. Uh, Jesus was resurrected by the glory of God. Glory, you know, when Jesus was sent up into his glory, he then sent the Holy Spirit. And John is going to elaborate on this in John 14, when the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name and my power and my authority, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all the things I said to you. So, this is our basis for uh, understanding that the scriptures are inspired by God. We don't have to depend on, you know, fishermen or a tax collector's memory, because the Holy Spirit brought the things back to their mind that he wanted them to write. So then they remembered that these things were written about him in the Old Testament, and that, oops, they had done these things to him. So <laughs> they don't understand, but the Spirit of God helps people understand. Now, in you know, most theology, they've got this little thing called the doctrine of illumination. And for... Uh, a number of years, I, you know, I looked at the verses that supposedly support this, and all the ones that the theologians used were out of context. And then I looked at what all the commentaries wrote, and I realized, these guys don't have a whole lot of illumination. <laughs> so I'm thinking, hmm, what's going on here? Uh, the Spirit should be guiding them. And the Spirit does guide believers in the truth. Of course, wish he guided more commentators in writing what's true. Uh, but he guides them, uh, bringing to mind the things that they need to know to do what pleases him. And that's part of the seeking his face, counseling you with his eye upon you, that kind of stuff. So the Holy Spirit worked in the disciples to help them write truth. He works in us in helping us bring this to mind and apply it. Because we're in a situation where we could sin, the Spirit brings certain truth to mind to help us not do that. We're, we're asking God, what do I do? The Spirit brings to mind what we need to do. Uh, he helps, which is a phenomenal thing. Um, I think some of the versions call this the paraclete, which some people thought was the parakeet. But uh, <laughs> um, that the Spirit of God helps believers understand the truth and unbelievers can't understand it. Which is kind of bogus because, as you know, some of the best commentaries and well, I told you, it's un you know, on some passages are written by people who are unbelievers. So, you know, my Hebrew prof, Al Ross, basically said that his prof at Oxford, or at Cambridge, um, turned him on. I mean, they knew, he knew, knew the truth, 
and he understood it, he said, I just don't believe it. And the prophet said that Umberto Casuto, a atheistic Jew, wrote the best commentaries on Genesis and Exodus. And I went and got them. And you know, the guy is like brilliant and just tracing an argument through. He knows the language. He's just, this is what the thing says, just like they're you know, great scholars who understand what Homer said. So you don't really need um, you know, this Holy Spirit. Oops, I shouldn't really say it that way. To understand what is written, but to actually embrace it is a work of the Holy Spirit in nudging you in the right direction. They can. They do. Correct. Because they're getting it. Well, you could, people would then say, oh, that's because God has drawn them. But, you know, so, you know, God does guide us in truth. Um, he does it regularly for those of you who seek him. Um, and he um, continues, you know, the Spirit does that today. You know, the Spirit's goal is to glorify Jesus. Remember that? So, I, I tell you the story once. So, been a believer for oh, two or three, four or five months, somewhere in there. And I was driving to the post office in downtown Ithaca. And um, because I was basically not around a group of Christians, I was, you know, listening to the radio, you know, I was involved in a lot of sources, uh, trying to sift through them. And uh, I heard this one uh, woman, Florence Henderson, her name, say, yeah, on a talk show interview, yeah, the Holy Spirit is really coming into his own. And uh, I didn't know a whole lot back then, but this this verse came to mind that the whole Father Jesus said that the Spirit was going to come to glorify Him, not to glorify Himself. And I said that doesn't sound right. <laughs> that the Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus. So if the Spirit is at work in someone, ultimately God's glory is seen. Christ's purposes are embraced. He is exalted. His body, you know, is exalted. Um, his mission is exalted. The things that he wants to have happen are what happen. Individuals are not exalted. And normally what I was observing from what I heard from people saying they got the spirit is that they were glorifying themselves, not Jesus. So the reason God tells us or guides us in our quiet times and answers our prayer and all this other stuff is so he can ultimately look good. It's not just for our benefit. It's We're going to see we're born to die. Um, we're not born to just live comfortably. So we're going to look at the fact that it's a team witness. Notice there are a number of people. Let me catch that headline before I uh, leave it. Oops, sorry. A team witness to the reality of the Messiah in, the, in our lives produces enduring change. So uh, frequently in, I've had this experience you know, talking with believers, um, particularly, I've heard this a lot with my family, that um, people would excuse away their testimony because, oh, well, that's you, right? Oh, you're such a nice person. I've never heard that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but then when they meet a lot of other nice people, and when that's why it's, you get people around the body, then they realize, wait a minute, it's just not this one person. It's just not their experience. It's, it's a corporate testimony, and God's plan is that there would be a corporate testimony. Relatively few examples, like... Uh, Ethiopian eunuch is one where it's just an individual thing. It's a corporate thing. Uh, and that's why, you know, having a, you know, parties and uh, partying with the pagans so that they can be exposed to the body is a very good thing to have happen. So thanks for all of you who had birthdays to make that happen. Not that you actually plan to have a birthday, but all right. So uh, therefore the people who were with him uh, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb, raised him from the dead and bore witness. Okay, so there's the corporate witness part. Okay. So it's not just the fact that Lazarus is there. Others, people say, yeah, I saw the guy die, and now he's alive. I, I saw it happen. So we're witnesses to our experience with Jesus. Um, for this reason, the people who also met Jesus, because they heard that he'd done the sign, um, <laughs> the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. So this is, I find this really funny. So here they are complaining um, that their efforts to suppress the truth about what happened with Lazarus, uh, as they did with, uh, remember the blind man, the guy was born blind, don't tell anybody. You know, it's like they're, they're persecuting people who were uh, healed by Jesus. That's the idea where you get opposition. 
uh, they're trying to repress it. And then I say, look, the whole world's gone after him. And then the Holy Spirit prompts John to put, now there were certain Greeks among those who also came up to worship at the feast. Uh, so they were non-Jews from outside and they came in and it's actually, the whole world is going after him. So it's validation that uh, God is accomplishing his purposes despite the opposition. They came up to worship and then they come to a guy called Philip who was from Bethsaida, Galilee, uh, just up where Jesus came from, uh, and asked him saying, sir, we would wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip told Jesus. So again, there's that team effort. I remember uh, one of my profs, uh, Prof. Hendricks, said, every time you see Philip in the scriptures, he's bringing someone to Jesus. Um, and yeah, I guess I didn't examine all that. Uh, I don't usually take his word for stuff because he knows how to study the scriptures. But uh, you, you do see that. And that's, you know, Jesus said to those who followed him, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And here they are doing it. And that is something that should be part of our lives, an individual and a corporate witness that brings people to Jesus. So uh, when I, normally when I encounter Christians, I ask them, you know, so, you know, where do you go to church? And uh, and I listen without prompting them, what, what do they say about their church? And uh, the thing that I most frequently hear is, oh, the music's great and the people there are so nice. Music, people, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. That's it. And they have great community. And it's about community, not Christianity. And the they're there just basically because it's a fun, social get-together. I was recently talking to someone who basically talked about a um, book club that they're part of, which sounded just like what I've heard basic Bible studies, except... They probably don't drink as much wine. The guy said, yeah, yeah, we get around, we talk. And uh, then, you know, when the wine goes out, we kind of go home. And it's just a social time. And, and it's not teaching people to obey. That, that's what the mark of a biblical church is. They are actually teaching people to obey the truth. I think churches are good about, you need to be a witness, but they're not good about making people so they have something to witness about. All they can do is go and share a track, but not their own life. So the goal is that you share the life. I mean, you get the life, then share the life. Um, okay, so now we got glorifying the God, which is our purpose for life, necessitates us dying. Huh? Yeah. Purposefully and painfully. Oops, I'm not going to stop. This is getting painful. I don't want to listen to this anymore. What are we supposed to die to? Our old life and instead live for life eternal. Okay, so we're put on this planet to glorify God. And unless you tap into that is your purpose and that is your guiding light and that is the thing that focuses you, you'll wind up doing Satan's will rather than God's will. Uh, you'll do all kinds of good Christian-y things. Um, you'll you know, basically say, I'm going to give my life to studying the scriptures. Well, you also need to apply them. So my favorite verse out of Ezra 7.10 is, Ezra said it's hard to learn it, live it, teach it. And uh, glorifying God, making him look good in the eyes of others, should be the filter through which all our actions and decisions are put. And when I talk about, um, I don't want to kill the giant killer and you're facing the various giants, the, the thing that needs to be in our thoughts is, what is going to glorify God? And I kind of looked this week at uh, some similarities between David and Caleb as they are you know, facing giants. David, in the case of Goliath. Uh, Caleb, in the case of the giant librarians. If you want to know what that means ahead of time, go look on Daily Truth Base. And you have um, both of them concerned with the glory of God. Um, my favorite line out of David's uh, interplay with uh, exchange in the Goliath uh, narrative is who is this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of the living God? <laughs> Just like, he, he's not, everyone else is cowering in fear of Goliath and he's there. Wait, who's this guy who's d dinging God's reputation? And I, I kind of listened to uh, the whole interchange and uh, also Moses in the past. And Moses was concerned about the glory of God. David was concerned about the glory of God. Jesus is concerned about the glory of God. The Holy Spirit is concerned about the glory of God. 
gee, I wonder if we should be concerned about the glory of God. So we should be able to take a look at the things that we do and say how they contribute to the glory of God because it's into our value system where we put it through this filter. How does this glorify God? How does this make him look good in the eyes of others? Uh, will this cause others to want to follow him as well? So if you don't have a purpose in life, this is it. Um, I this looked up, uh, I was on a website of... Uh, you know, the kind of uh, folks who have uh, low latent inhibition. And uh, I just uh, just felt so sad for the folks because they're relatively bright people, but they are just purposeless and despairing because they have no purpose for their life. And, you know, unfortunately what they've seen from Christianity is, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. And rightly so, because like Christianity is not, as practic commonly practiced, very appealing of course, you could also argue in the Old Testament, New Testament times, like, you know, having a bunch of Christians dying isn't very appealing either. But the secular textbooks will say one of the reasons that Christianity spread is because the people died well. So, you know, martyrs actually serve a purpose. So we don't actually have to die in flesh and blood, but we do have to die internally. And our death to self needs to be purposeful and it's going to be painful. The captain of our salvation is perfected through suffering. So embrace the pain. Um, it's actually good for you. What do you need to die to? Your old life. So next week we're going to look at, uh, I think we might do it out of Romans 6. I'm still working on it. Just because we're doing Bible study in Romans 6, and it's just great to kill two birds with one stone. But uh, you know, just as Jesus was, you know, went into the ground and came up to live a new life, we too should die so we can live a new life. And the thing that keeps people from living a new life is they are still carrying around the corpse of their old life. Not the physical corpse, but the um, values, the ideas, the, the thinking that determines, you know, the phase of our lives. And then after we die, we live for the eternal. And you shouldn't be able to see this out of here. So Jesus, let's pick up our previous verse. Um... Wow, it's right after that. Yeah, he basically doesn't interact with the uh, Greeks. He says, um, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So, you know, it's funny. Wouldn't you expect him to say the Son of Man should be crucified? <laughs> um, so he isn't just looking at the death. He is looking at what it produces, which is, you know, or Good thing for killing giants. You look at not just the short-term difficulty, but the long-term gain. And, and Jesus's perspective is that he was going to be glorified. And it's not that he, oh no, I'm going to be killed. He actually goes on to elaborate. Truly, truly, most assuredly, I say to you, that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone or remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And certain here, the parable of the seed and the sower. Okay, so I'm not going to go there because you all know that one. Um, but what I want to insert in here is the thought that there are a lot of dead or fallen Christians around. <laughs> they're off the vine, they've fallen, and they're just sitting there. And they don't actually die, which is necessary for reproducing. So uh, basically a city guy, although I like to plant things to see uh, if they can live or not. And uh, one of the things I tried doing last fall was uh, broccoli sprouts. Because, you know, broccoli is supposed to be really good for you. You're probably always finding broccoli that was organic. So I know, I'll make sprouts. So I don't know if you've ever done sprouts before. But uh, when you get them, it's a bunch of dead seeds. They're not on a plant. They're just there and they're dry. So before you actually need to, before you get them actually growing, you need to soak them. <laughs> and uh, one of the tricks that I discovered kind of late is I usually have to soak them in warm water because if you soak them in cold water, they just kind of stay there. But that soaking is supposed to get rid of that hard outer case. It gets rid of some of the inhibitors to uh, the, the seed. It's rid of some sexticides that are naturally in there to keep uh, the bugs from eating the seed. And it, unless it gets softened up and that outer skin, that outer crust gets removed, 
it stays a broccoli seed. Um, and they say, you know, soak them for a couple hours overnight. And, you know, I've soaked some of these things for a week. <laughs> I've got some that I've been soaking for two weeks, and, and yeah, they're, they're dead. I don't know what happened to those seeds. I got some of them to sprout last time. I just decided it's not. But as I'm sitting here looking at my bowl of dead broccoli seeds, uh, I was reflecting on the fact that why, why are these sprouting? They're supposed to sprout. <laughs> uh, and as I hit this verse, uh, yeah, it, it fell, but they didn't really die. It, it didn't die to being a seed. In order for it to die to being a seed, it had to crack open its outer shell and become something different. You can't stay the same thing and expect to produce new life. You've got to be something different. So the seed's got to fall to the ground. And I think a lot of Christians have got this thing, oh yeah, don't be in the world. Um, but then you got to die. And then you produce seed for others. So I guess the application is soak yourself in the word. Um, let it you know, permeate your life. It's got to get through your natural defenses. It's got to get into basically your heart. And then from there, it can start producing the new life. Now, as an incentive, Jesus repeats something that is in other spots, uh, one of my favorite concepts in the scripture. He who loves his life, and the word for life is soul, will lose it. Hmm. And he who hates his life in this world, hmm, in this world, will save it for eternal life. Okay, so... I'm supposed to hate myself. Bad bear. <laughs> no, that's not the kind of self-loathing. Um, it's you get rid of the self-protection. Um, you basically, the thing you're supposed to hate is your life in this world. You don't consider life in this world something to be held onto. Just like Jesus did not consider life in heaven something to be held onto. You need to let it go. So if in seeking to do God's will, things don't go the way you thought they would, or the way you dreamed it would happen, and your aspirations are crushed, um, get over it. <laughs> it's, it's not You're going to miss out in the future. Because if you want to preserve your soul for this life, you're going to lose it for the next. It's really an either or. As Jesus said, it's very first sermon, sermon on the mount. You know, it's like you can't serve God and man. You can't serve um, mammon and God. Um, you can't live for the praise of others and the praise of God. Um, it's like one or the other. And God constantly, throughout the scriptures, puts a choice before people. You know, choose life so that you might live, says Moses. Uh, Joshua, uh, choose this day who you're going to serve. Um, is it Ezra who's got the other one? It's up in the uh, historical books when they come back at the end. Um, it's another choose, it, choose to uh, serve God. So I want to spend one little more time on here. Has, has there been a time in your life where you basically said, I am going to seek first the kingdom of God more than I seek first anything in this life? Um, you need to say that. And uh, the old time church used to call this dedication, um, consecration. Um, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Um, I surrender all was like the famous altar call, which we sung earlier uh, today, where people would basically say, okay, God, I'm quit my fighting. It's like, take my life and let it be left alone. I mean, no, <laughs> consecrated, Lord, to thee. Okay. So we basically need to have it, you know, pursue the holiness. Um, and that means separate or distinct from what we were. So you love your life, you'll lose it. You hate your life in this life, in this world, you will gain it, save it, keep it for eternal life. Um, it's Look at the 24 and 25, how they go together. Try to preserve your life as what it was. You won't get anything that produces eternal life. But die to what you were. Become what God wants you to become, and you uh, get eternal life. And then that's going to be, if anyone wants to serve me, so anyone can do this, let them follow me. And then you get fellowship as well as fun. 
follow me where I am, there my servant will also be. So John 14 is going to elaborate on this. You know, if you, he has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me, he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love him and uh, manifest myself to him. Uh, 26, I think that is, and a couple verses later, 28, uh, you get the father in there as well. And then if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The corollary is also true. If you don't serve Jesus, the Father will not honor you. Now, this is all through the scripture. Um, I was just kind of looking at David and Saul and saw the significance of being in the court of the king and to being in his service. And that was a big deal. And that's those who served the king who went out to battle for him were the ones who sat at his table and dined with him. So it's not just something you make up against of other Middle Eastern parables, uh, parallels. It's like Jesus has promised this will happen. And if you're, unless you're on a diet, go look at all the banqueting references. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Jesus said those who follow him will sit down and feast with him. But those who don't are going to miss out. And eternity is a very, very long time. So whenever I hear someone say, oh, there's no reward or no benefit from serving God, I realize this is not someone energized by the Spirit of God. This is actually someone who's energized by the Spirit of this world who is opposed to the Spirit of God. Satan has got a hold on their life. Because this is truth that the Holy Spirit wants people to embrace. Yet they fight against it, just like they fight against Jesus being the Messiah. So rewarding verses to consider is a spot to get you started. And then Jesus has an emotional moment. <laughs> My soul is troubled. Okay, he, he, he knows he's going to have to die. He's thinking, you know, so I'm sure Jesus, he, we, earlier we have, he set his face like a flint to get to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to die. He's been teaching his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to be resurrected. So he, he knew that death was coming. He knew that it wasn't going to be fun. And he's just thinking about death and serving and what's going to happen in the future. And his soul is troubled. And you go to John 17 and he basically heightens it and says, my soul is overwhelmed within me. All right? So it wasn't like, oh, die, no, no problem to it. It is going to be painful, but God is with you through it. And that's a piece that we miss because we don't spend time like Mary did sitting at Jesus' feet cultivating that relationship with God. So then when the going gets tough, we quit or don't follow through. And what should I say? Save me from this hour? Hmm. If Jesus said that and the Father saved him from the hour, we would still be dead in our sins. For this purpose, I came to this hour. So, what Jesus has done here, and I want you to kind of enter into his thinking a bit, he goes back to why he's in this mess in the first place. <laughs> it's all part of God's plan to glorify himself, not only to save humanity, but also Ephesians 3.10, purpose of creation and sharing his glory with uh, those who are faithful to him. So the purpose determines his practice. That's why if you look at toil, the overriding arching thing is, what's your purpose? Then what are your objectives? Then what are your goals? Then what are the steps for the goals? And sometimes we get stuck on the steps and kind of realize that our steps aren't always inspired. We need to go back and affirm what our purpose is. Um, in our praise time, we heard Ephesians 2, 10. We're saved to do good works that God prepared for us to do. And that always brings me back to Psalm 139. God wove us together for this. So God has uniquely made each one of us for specific purposes. We need to tap into that. We need to be asking, not God, why have you made me thus? But what have you made me for? You know, why has God given you all the stuff he's given you? What does he want to see it used for? Hint, hint. It's going to be for his glory. So then you need to say, how, how can you draw a line between your life and God's glory? And it might involve killing giants. It might involve pain. It will involve pain. It might involve suffering. It will involve suffering. Uh, but the Spirit of God will be with you. And uh, this is kind of a nutshell form of not my will, but thine be done. Father, glorify your name. That's, that's what's supposed to happen. Then he goes psychotic. He hears voices. <laughs> Nobody's born for Jesus. 
I'm sure Jesus heard a lot of what the Father told him. The Father said, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Wow. Okay. Now we got two glorifies to be thinking about. How did God glorify it the first time, and how is he going to glorify it again? Um, Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, which actually follows this, I have glorified you by completing the work that uh, you gave me to do, which was training the disciples. Maybe it's that. Or it could have been the Old Testament. I mean, it's, it's, you know, to bring Jesus to this moment, uh, God was orchestrating all the events of history. Um, that could have been it. When we glorify it again, short term, you'd probably say, oh, the resurrection. Uh, but the biggie is when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom and rewards his faithful servants. So uh, you can look this up in different commentaries and you know, take whatever you want for it as to what it actually is. Um, but the people who stood by heard it. Some said it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now, I, I noticed two interesting responses to this. And that this, John is so big on this duality throughout the whole gospel. Uh, there's the physical realm and the spiritual realm. There's, you know, I, I have meat teeth that you don't know of, uh, John 4. But someone bring him a sandwich, but here he is doing the Father's will. So, you know, it's like this. There's all this stuff going on where the disciples don't get it. But here you have two people, and sometimes what they hear, even something as clear as God's voice, is meaningless thunder to them. And we're going to actually see why, hopefully in the next slide or two. Uh, I think I put it in there. Maybe I dreamed it. We'll see. Um, and then others actually said an angel has spoken. They heard words. Um, remember, the disciples actually heard, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Hear him, the man of transfiguration. So uh, there's people who don't get it. They don't know how to hear God's voice. And um, it's the next slide after this one. He says, now, no, uh, in the man of transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Yeah. Uh, this one is, that wasn't at the garden. He's still, he hasn't gone to the garden yet because you still have to have the washing the disciples' feet, the upper room discourse, and then you get the garden. Um, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Ah, now we get the bad guy that's introduced into it. The guy who had entered into Judas's heart and was controlling him. Um, now obviously is not cast out now. Um, it was, it's basically at the cross. He is defeated, um, but still, he's still the rule of this world until Jesus comes and actually binds him in um, the abyss. And then Jesus says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men, all peoples to myself. And this is not about his resurrection. He said, signifying the death he would die. So if you go look how John uses lifted up, uh, it's about the uh, crucifixion. And then the people, missing it, because uh, they basically, we have heard from the law that Christ, the Messiah, remains forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Just like, remember, when we looked at the Pharisees thing? Oh, the Messiah can't be from Galilee. You know, look and see. Does the Messiah come from Bethlehem, not from Galilee? So they, they basically are hearing Jesus, his very words, you know, just like earlier in the Gospels, they saw his very miracles, they rejected it. Uh, the prince of this world is still very active then and now. And these people are missing what Jesus is saying because they're fixated on, um, oh, the Messiah is supposed to live forever. Well, if they understood Jesus, he said he's going to be resurrected. But uh, he doesn't answer their questions. And we'll see why. In this next one, oh, okay, still got another, another couple screens to get to the one I wanted. Um, living, walking in the light of the truth keeps us from the darkness of a hardened heart, which is a heart of unbelief, and eventually judgment. Probably should have a, and the eventual judgment come in there. All right. So, living, walking in the light of the truth keeps you out of the dark. The people who couldn't hear God's voice are still in the dark. 
They had ears, but they did not hear. It's all through the Gospels. Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you, which is a week. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. To many as received him, says John 1.12, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Um, then Jesus spoke these things, and he was hidden from them after he departed. So this is like his last message to folks. Um, they're in the dark. They're not responding to the light. Therefore, they go further into the dark. This is I'm like, yeah. I kind of like that thought because it's so intuitively obvious that if you move away from the light into the dark, you basically are walking away from the light. So every further step you take goes further into the dark to get to the point where you can no longer even see the light because it becomes so far away out there. Just that little thing there. And you stumble and uh, it works. I mean, it doesn't work. So he's imploring them to have belief in the things that they clearly see. And one of my mantras is, do not doubt in the dark what you've seen in the light. This is why you need to be consistently in the word, understanding it, so when you see something that might conflict with it, you don't buy Satan's lie, which often is disguised as scripture. And then, this is the uh, screen I wanted to get to. He departed from them. Did I get the last verse there? Although he did many signs before, they still did not believe him. Okay, so we've been through that with the Pharisees. Like It's like Jesus had done so many things. He said, okay, no more signs, just the sign of Jonah. And even with the sign of Jonah, they still resist the Spirit of God trying to guide them in truth. This is that the word of Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So the arm of the Lord is the miracles that he's doing. Uh, but they could not believe. Why not? Because Isaiah said again, um, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they should see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. <laughs> so when I first came across this, I don't know if you can recall the times you came across this, but wait a minute, I thought Jesus wanted to save everybody, and here he's making it so they can't even hear him. And this goes along with something that Jesus also did. He started, when the people rejected him, he started speaking to them in parables. And if they didn't understand the real clear stuff, there's like no way they're going to get the parables. And then this goes along with uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. Um, he quotes the bit, he's going to speak to these people with stammering lips, uh, foreign tongues, so they don't understand what's going on. Thinking, you know, here God is the master communicator who made our ears so we could hear him, making it so people can't hear him. What's going on? The, if you go back into the context, and I don't have time to do that, you're welcome to just find a cross reference to do it. You can see that Israel was rejecting God. And because they rejected him, they were walking in the dark. So God is basically hardening them in their choice. It's one of the most scary things in life to not make the wrong choices because God can harden you in them and you don't understand and you don't turn and you don't get healed and all you have facing you is judgment. So you want to be very sensitive to God, have a heart that's tender towards God. So when we talk about uh, having being wholehearted, we're going to talk more about uh, not wholehearted, wholehearted, you don't want to be hardhearted, but um, it's a sign of judgment that God is opposed to a person when they are not sensitive to truth. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. So remember that the glory is that uh, uh, that is going through this passage. Uh, Isaiah saw the glory, understood what God was doing, and uh, recorded it. Nevertheless, now here's a set. I know if you see this interchange going back and forth, and I probably didn't do a great job of highlighting each time, but uh, even among the rulers, many believed in him. So in spite of the opposition, in spite of the best efforts of Satan, people will still believe. Um, in the news today, you know, the uh, Egyptian Coptic church was uh, blown up. Uh, 
can, can you imagine what a church is like in the midst of a Muslim world that is very much opposed to them, <laughs> um, even to the point of death? Yet, they still believe. There are other spots where the church has been totally wiped out in Northern Africa, uh, but the Coptic tradition goes way back. There's actually even a manuscript that scholars use uh, that comes out of the Coptic tradition. Um, they believed in him, but they didn't confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So if you go to Romans 10, uh, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there, um, you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord in order to really get the full aspects of your salvation. Believe in your heart and confess. These guys believe, but didn't confess. Uh, they just got you know, the fire insurance policy of their salvation. Um, they missed that on the opportunity to get martyred or be used by God. Um, it, it always disturbs me that um, all of Jesus' followers were martyred. Uh, you know, John was exiled, so... Okay. Uh, but you, you need to basically enter the Christian life saying, I'm dead to the old, so it doesn't matter what happens to me in the future. Um, because of the Pharisees, they did not be confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. How do you think those rulers are going to feel when they stand before God and the guy in front of them hears, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your Lord. And then they get told, uh, who are you again? You know, it's like they, they traded looking good before men and wind up looking bad before God. And one of the things that should be driving us is looking good before our Lord and Savior. He basically said, I'm coming back to judge you guys, so uh, make sure you're looking good and ready and alert for it. Um, leaders of the people, which is like, you know, it could be any of the leaders of the sects. It could be leaders of the uh, people in the fire, synagogue rulers. I mean, it's just a generic one. It's not just talking about a little civil group. Uh, we know, like Nicodemus was a Pharisee. We know that like Gamaliel, or let's say, say his name was. So we know there are these people who did that. Okay, almost over. Jesus cried out and said in a loud voice, "Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but him who sent me. He who sees me sees him who sent me." So uh, there's much of Christianity is just focused on Jesus, but Jesus is, wants to get us into the Father. Um, we need to understand God, and you do that mainly through the Old Testament. I've come as a light into the world. He who um, believes in me should not abide in darkness. So all you believers who believe in Jesus should be living in the light, walking in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship with other believers in the light, not remaining in darkness. You remain in darkness if you don't die to yourself. You'll stay there fighting alone. Um, anyone hears my word, doesn't believe, I do not judge him. I didn't come to judge, but to save. This kind of looks almost uh, contradictory. But basically, the words that Jesus spoke are going to judge us in the last day. Um, because he's speaking the words that God the Father um, gave him to speak. Which is also a really interesting phrase right here, this one. Um, Whatever I say, said Jesus, is what the Father commanded I speak. And then I know that his command is everlasting life. This is another cool verse. I don't have time to do this one. It's just the uh, copy of the linking verb. Um, both command and everlasting life are nominative case, which is basically equating the two. And its command results in, leads to, causes, uh, is uh, resulting in eternal, everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. And then he goes to the disciples in the upper room. And um, I guess I should point out uh, what Jesus said about obeying his commands. He who has my commands and keeps them, that's the guy who loves me. If we're calling him Lord, let's live as if he is our Lord under his headship. Okay, questions. I have a few down here, but... Uh, I have a question sure. about the connection between the disciples Passed on request of this Greek guy who wants to see him and all of his information. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Have any ideas on? Okay, so the, the way the Gospels are written is uh, 
The Holy Spirit brings to the mind of the gospel writers the, the information that is arranged according to a purpose. Okay? So, John is written for a universal audience. Matthew to Jews, Mark to Romans, Luke to Greeks, John universal. And he's showing that this message goes out beyond just the um, Jews. So, when these guys come... To Jesus, uh, what verse is that one? All right, so twenty. There could be interchange going on here that we don't see, but if you look at the very next thing that Jesus says, it's that. Um, these guys are worshipers. They've actually come because they are, even though they're Greeks, they've come to there to try to follow the Jewish stuff. And he, they want to see Jesus, but not just as a celebrity. He's giving them, basically, this is a major message of discipleship right here. So if you want to follow me, I mean, if you want to serve me, follow me, and then you'll get honored and stuff like that. So he, he doesn't give, he basically you know, covers in the fact that he's going to be glorified, and then he immediately puts it back to them that you guys need to Follow me just like, you know, everyone else does. And then you're going to eventually get judged. So if you kind of took the rest of this passage and you just excerpt out a few ideas, that's kind of what you get. Um, going to die. You need to follow. Judgment's coming. Real simple. Three points. Home. You got a sermon. Yeah, and then there's in 45. It does. He talks about seeing again. And he would give me peace when he sent me. So it's like, oh, he's about to get peace. He's part of the yeah, and it's quite possible that some of the disciples also explained more to them later. So, um, yeah, it isn't. And John is just like, he talks in circles. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah. John, the letters of John and Revelation uh, are not as linear as uh, I understand the rest of the scriptures to be. Um, but it's just amazing how... Uh, I'm going to have a long chat with him when I see him. <laughs> so, John, uh, tell me, what were you thinking there? <laughs> All right, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Huh? How much time to keep to yourself or to give him? Oh, okay, in terms of, yeah. I think it's a decision that you have to make at one point, and then you have to repeat Almost every morning. Because Romans 12, 1 and 2 says we are supposed to offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, which means ongoing every day. Jesus said you need to deny yourself daily. Deny yourself daily. So in my mind, when I say the word Lord, particularly when I wake up and say, Good Lord, morning. <laughs> Or, I mean, good morning, Lord. Yeah, right, right. Um, um, I, I recognize that's the one that I obey, that I follow, not my will, but thine be done. So, my agenda, whatever you want. Now, let's remember the slave in the vomitorium didn't have some of the freedoms that we do with how we spend our time, but we have a fairly you know, good amount. So, when I do the wholehearted thing, um, I'll talk more about giving God your entire heart. And then you use what he gives. Me time is only stuff that God chooses to allow us to have. As opposed to first blocking out time for me. Someone did a great uh, email on uh, the fact, on the wholehearted stuff, where you know they, they block out their stuff and then they kind of figure out, okay, we're going to put in now down here. Now that I've done all the stuff I want to do, uh, we're going to give God some service. And then they do wind up giving God far more service than most people. But that's not the way it's supposed to be because we're supposed to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Um, someone else gave a really good illustration, which I'll also talk about, where um, they did a fraction thing on me. It was like <laughs> when they're cutting up the heart, you know, if there's like, if there's one, you know, 16th or one 64th or one 128th or one, one 256th of an inch or heart that is not God's, we are not wholehearted. And Satan, this is the point that he made, which I thought was brilliant, will use that one little spot as a foothold. So this is where we really have to let go of our agenda. Just say, not my will, but thine be done. So when we call him Lord, that's what it's it. So 
Uh, I'll talk more about whole, Benander wholeheartedly. Last call. Uh, I did want to draw your attention to these questions because uh, I only gave you three, so you'll actually pay attention to them. I'm going to have to drop it down to one. Um, in terms of thinking about making God, glorifying God, um, understand what attracted you to Jesus, and recognizing that that is part of your testimony, but that doesn't always attract others. So uh, you need to kind of figure out what are people looking for and be able to show them that Jesus did that. Uh, we, you know, if we have a group of people that have been made alive from the dead, uh, which we do as a body, um, there is an attraction. Oh, I just love your friends. They're so other-centered. <laughs> Um, are you walking in the light or something around the dark? How do you know that you're in one or the other? Uh, keep think about that. A little bit of self, um, taking heed to yourself. And the other thing is, what are you a witness to? We should be having stuff that God's been doing in our lives, and this, this group fortunately does, um, that we can share this is what God happened, I did. But to put a little guard on that, it's supposed to bear fruit. Jesus said in John 15, In this is my glor Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and show prove to be my disciples. So if we're not bearing fruit, we might want to consider, you know, if we're not, people aren't coming to Christ and we're not teaching people to obey the truth and they're not passing that on to others so that they obey the truth, we might want to figure out what is keeping us from bearing the fruit. And you know, go back to John 15, it's it's kind of scary. Uh, you suffer judgment for not bearing fruit. So you go back to John 12 and you find out, okay, you got to die to bear fruit. Otherwise, you don't bear fruit. So, uh, you know, people in my own life too, there's been a breakthrough in terms of fruit bearing when uh, it became the most important thing in my life. I specifically remember that, but I don't have time for it. So maybe in another time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of light who brings light so that we can have life. We thank you that if we give our life to you, you give us a far, far greater life back both now and in the future. Father, our de desire is for you to be glorified in our midst through our body, through our lives, through the works we do, uh, the things we say. I pray that you would um, exalt yourself. I pray that as we encounter the Easter season and people are um, a little more attuned culturally to uh, the death and resurrection of our Savior, that you would draw them to yourself through us and we would be sensitive to your spirit in terms of how and what you want us to share. Um, I pray that there be conversations this week and next uh, for your glory's sake in Christ's name. Amen.